Join me in prayer for the pastor. Father God, on this great and beautiful day, we come before you and praise you that we are blessed to be able to worship together. Uh, blessed to have a place to come. Uh, so we lift up Casa and thank you for them. Blessed that our congregation is able to gather again in so many large parts. And for those who aren't able, Lord, thank you that they're able to attend online. Uh, Lord, I lift up now our Pastor Mike. Uh, you have placed upon his heart this psalm. You prepared it for him this week, Lord, as I guess the, the final of our, of our summer in the psalms. Um, Lord, and I just uh, I thank you for the preparation you've placed on his heart, for the work that he has done this week, for uh, the weeks that we have all had as hectic or crazy or, or peaceful or whatever they were, Lord. I pray that all those things will be behind us now as we sit to listen and be washed by your word. Thank you, Lord, for your word that you give to us through faithful teachers and preachers, Lord. Thank you for our Pastor Mike for being just such a man. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Good morning again, family. <clears throat> it is a pleasure to be here together this morning and to have the opportunity to again go to the Psalms and open the Word of God <clears throat> and hear from Him what He would have for us today. And, uh, and so I invite you to turn in your Bibles uh, to Psalm 127. That will be our text this morning, Psalm 127. And as you find uh, your place there, I'll invite you to stand yet again for the reading of God's Word this morning. Psalm 127. It's only five verses. But that shouldn't matter. Praise God. Five Beautiful verses. Let's read them together this morning. Psalm 127, a song of ascents, a psalm of Solomon. Let's begin. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Again this morning. Again, a song of ascents. We were just uh, three psalms uh, to the right, so to speak, uh, last week as we were in Psalm 130, which was also a song of ascents. And we talked about what that means. It's talking about these psalms that have been grouped together in the book of Psalms that the children of Israel would sing as they made their pilgrimage, their journey from their place of abode to the temple on top of Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And they would sing these songs, these songs of ascent, to prepare their minds and their hearts to enter into the presence of God in the temple. And they're very important things that are brought up in these psalms. Most of them are... Uh, relatively short uh, as it is compared to the rest of some of the psalms. And, and we've already seen the, the disparity between the length 
of these different songs. In fact, we started uh, our, our endeavor this summer in Psalm 119, uh, which is not only the longest psalm, but the longest chapter in the whole Bible. Um, it would be difficult even to sing that whole psalm in one sitting. Um, and, and we also were in Psalm 117, which is the sh not only the shortest psalm, but the shortest chapter in the whole Bible. Uh, and so there are many different uh, types of psalms, uh, but in these songs of ascent, they are all relatively short. They, they have a relatively pointed meaning, uh, and, and they are very uh, foundational for our understanding for what it means to uh, live, as it were, corum Deo, which is Latin for before the face of God. Um, and and they, these psalms were meant to cause the people of Israel to not only be introspective, but circumspective. That they would not only take a look inwardly at their own life, but circumspectly at the lives of their family and at the lives of their nation, uh, for them as a, a people of God. And so we look today at this psalm. Uh, I believe that it is hopefully perhaps a familiar psalm. At least the first verse of this psalm should be familiar for those who have been a part of Redemption Hill for very long, for it is upon this verse that we began this endeavor of forming and planting a church called Redemption Hill with an understanding that unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain. Uh, and, and I hope, I pray that if you've been in church for any number of years, for any length of time, that this would be a familiar verse to you. It ought not only to be familiar, it ought to be uh, a verse of affection for you. Not only ought to be a verse of affection, it ought to be a verse that is at once motivating you to work and at the same time calling you to rest. Motivating you to work and at the same time calling you to rest. These verses ought to be verses that really give foundation and shape to what it means to live before the Lord. These verses call us to an understanding of the joining together or the juxtaposition of man's responsibility and God's ultimate sovereignty. And so let's look at these verses together this morning. Let's look first at the first two verses. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. What a line. For he gives to his beloved sleep or rest. He gives to his beloved rest. Now notice that this song, this psalm is attributed not to David, not to Asaph, not to the sons of Korah, but to another king, the son of David, King Solomon. King Solomon was also the writer of another book of the Bible called Ecclesiastes. And you can hear a familiar voice in this psalm if you listen to it, if you have read Ecclesiastes before. Because what is the sum total of Ecclesiastes? All is vanity and chasing the wind, right? We, we hear that refrain in the book of Ecclesiastes over and over again. And what do we see Solomon as the writer of this psalm lifting to the third degree? Vanity. Three times. Remember in Hebrew culture what it means to repeat something three times. It is to draw attention to that thing and lift it to the nth degree, so to speak. And three times Solomon repeats this vanity. He says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor, what? In vain. 
unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake. In what? In vain. And then he says for the third time, it is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he, the implied he there, is the Lord who builds and who watches and gives rest, uh, gives to his beloved sleep. And so here we see this song of Solomon, this song of ascents, this song that the children of Israel are being called to sing as they journey up the mountain. And where are they going? They are going, so to speak, to the house that Solomon built. Right? We've heard that turn of phrase used uh, a lot of times in sports, right? Uh, you talk about a great coach, and someday people might talk about uh, the Spurs as being the house that Doc uh, uh, Pop Pop. Pop built, right? Excuse me. The, the house that Pop built or, or any other uh, sports dynasty. You might hear people talk about the house that this coach built or in some cases uh, it may not be the coach at all but a particular player uh, if you uh, think about the house that Jordan built, so to speak, right? Here, the people of Israel are journeying up the mountain and Solomon himself the builder of the house of God. Remember, David wanted to build a house for the Lord, and the Lord told him, no, your son will build the house. And Solomon built the temple of God. And this temple stood as a monument to the glory, not of Solomon, but to the Lord. Uh, we know that people came from afar, not only to uh, hear the wisdom of Solomon, but also to see the grandeur of this house that Solomon had built, not for himself, but for the God of Israel, coming far and wide to see this place. And as Solomon uh, was the wisest man who ever was and likely ever will be apart from Christ, the temple that Solomon built likely was the greatest work of architecture that has ever been seen in the history of man. Uh, it is now since destroyed. And the house that was built in its place, the people who could remember the former glory wept because they knew that it would never see the grandeur that the original house of the Lord uh, was. Interestingly, though, that the prophet would prophesy that the glory of the latter will be greater than the former. How could that be? Unless, of course, it was speaking of the same temple that Christ was speaking of when He said, if you tear down this temple in three days, I will again rebuild it. Referring, of course, not to the brick and to the mortar, but to Himself. For Christ has become our temple. Amen? So here we see Solomon, and, and how, how poignant is it for the, the, the architect of the house that they are journeying towards to be the voice that reminds them that unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain. It's very important. It's also important that we understand that while it says house here, and there is a sense in which it is in a reference to uh, the nuclear family and to the homes that the families will build, it is most importantly about the house of the Lord. It is about the temple. It is about, in our case, the church, while at the same time being about the family. Likewise, as you journey through verse 1 and look at the next uh, phrase that he uses, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And, and you, can almost, you can almost imagine, uh, as a good architect, as a good king, Solomon uh, wandering through the works as they are being done in the city. 
taking an account, an estimation, as the work of the builders is being done, building this great temple, uh, making sure that, that the specific materials that were called for are being used in their rightful place, the cedars of Lebanon, the, the gold that came from the hills, everything that's being done, the, the craftsmen that were brought together for though Solomon was the builder of the house, it really was built by many hands, wasn't it? And you can imagine him taking in all of this activity and he himself, in the wisdom that God by the Spirit gave him, taking it in account himself and reminding himself that unless the Lord builds it, they who labor, labor in vain while he wanders looking up perhaps at the guard towers of the city and being reminded that unless the Lord watches over the city, they that watch it, watch it in vain. And so Solomon's wisdom is offered to us this morning. It's offered to us to remind us that, that it is very easy for us to, as he says here in very poetic but poignant language, to eat the bread of anxious toil. What a line. What a line. What, what does this imply? It means that, that there is substance coming in, but no satisfaction being met in the belly. Right? There is, there is, no, there is no satisfaction. We are eating the bread of anxious toil. That, in other words, we're, we're eating, but it's all in vain. It's, it's going in, but it's bringing no sustaining power. It, it is substance, but not sustenance. It's like eating air. <laughs> air pie, as uh, someone I know loves to say at times eating the bread of anxious toil. How do we do this? We do this when we fret over the building of our home, of our family. It is possible for us to wring our hands over and over and over again, fretting over all the minutia of what it means to be a family, to build a home, to build a house, and we labor and we labor and at times find that in our laboring we actually lose the very thing that we were working for. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives rest. He gives to his beloved sleep. He gives them rest. And how many fathers will at the end of their lives have lost the children that they thought they were working so hard for from sun up to sundown because they allowed their work to take them away from their family. How many mothers will have lost uh, the very ones that they were thought that they were worrying themselves so much about through their anxiousness drive their children away? eating the bread of anxious toil. I think that hit a nerve this morning. It got very quiet. It's a nerve that needs to be hit this morning. We need to understand that we have been called to build our homes. We have been called to watch over our community. We have been called to labor and to work, but not as if it depends all upon us but because it depends all upon God. Notice that I said it all depends upon God. I said earlier that this calls us to an understanding of the joining together of man's responsibility and God's sovereignty. There is work that we are called to do, but at the same time, what shall be done belongs entirely to the Lord and not to us. It's not you do a little bit and do your part and God does his part and you share in the glory. It is God orchestrating all things together for his good pleasure. He has invited you to work to his glory along with what he is doing and in the end, the glory belongs to him and not to you. So that 
God says that if you will train up a child in the way that they should go, when they are old, they will not depart from it, not because of what you have done, but because in the preservation of God's mercy, He will keep your children in spite of you, in spite of your failings, in spite of your shortcomings, so that you and your children can both rise up and lift their hands to heaven and say, but by the grace of God. Amen. And so we are reminded that unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And it is in vain that we rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep, or as it says in the King James, rest, rest, rest. This is what the Sabbath was all about. Do you think God was tired on the seventh day of creation? Had he worn himself out and needed a nap? No. He was setting a precedence for us. It was for our sake that He rested on the seventh day and called us in like manner to do the same. Remember why? It was an understanding that as much as we were spinning the hamster wheel of our work Monday through Friday, that on the Sabbath day we could retire from our work and trust that it was the Lord who was going to sustain us and not we ourselves. In the same way, when God brought manna from heaven, it was so important that they maintained this rest that he told them to collect double on the one day and nothing on the Sabbath day, trusting that God would sustain them through that time. But if on any other day they collected more, God made sure that the more spoiled before they could get there. God has called us to a similar rest, to a similar circumspection to our lives where we give unto the Lord what belongs to Him as if we could hold it from Him. It is His. But what are we doing when we return to the Lord what is already His? We are recognizing in our own lives and in our own hearts His place of authority in our own lives. We are not reminding Him that He is King, but we are reminding ourselves that He is King. When we rest from our work on the Lord's Day, it is not a reminder to God that He is King. It is a reminder to us that He is King. It is not a reminder to Him that He needs to provide for us, but it is a reminder for us that He will. And yet, what do we find? We find that if we choose not to honor the Lord in that way, that the very things we thought we were keeping, we may lose. I have been in the church since I was four days old. I was born on Barksdale Air Force Base in Bossier, Louisiana. And according to the rules at that time, when a baby was born on the base, they had to stay in the hospital for three days. And on day four, I was in the church. I've been in the church my whole life. And one of the saddest things that I have ever seen is to watch uh, friends of mine as they got older and their lives begin to get busier as they got into more of their preteen and teenage years. And, and things like... Uh, sports and activities and, and all these things and extra school activities and all these things begin to pop up. Now it used to be back in the day that uh, schools didn't schedule uh, sporting things on Sundays and on Wednesdays because they knew that there was church on Sunday morning and there was prayer meeting on Wednesday night. And in many communities they, they would not schedule things on those days. But while I was growing up, that began to change. 
Select teams became all the rage when I was a kid where it wasn't enough now to play for the school team. Now you had to be on this select team in the off season to, to help get your, you know, whatever thing was going to help you get to where you needed to be in high school and college to play your sports. And I began to watch my friends, friends that I had grown up in church with, begin to miss more and more and more church due to these things. And their lives became so busy with all of these extracurricular activities that soon what happened was even when the select season ended and we thought, hey, hey, softball's over, soccer's over, what, whatever, whatever extra sport it was, those were the two big ones, softball and soccer, where I was growing up. But then the family was so tired from all of that extra activity that even when the season was over, now they stayed home from church to rest, that they needed some rest. And it wasn't long before I watched some of my friends that I had grown up in church, and they were the ones, the most faithful. Some of their parents were deacons, some of them elders, and still they got dragged away, and it wasn't long before they just didn't have any use to come to church anymore. Can I tell you something? Let me, let me leave that there and I'll turn to something else and then I'll bring them together. At the same time, over all of those years, now 37 years of my life, as a pastor's kid and as a pastor myself, I have been present at and or presided over many funerals of faithful men. And time and time again, do you know what I have heard the sons and daughters of those faithful men get up and say, they can't, and, and it's difficult in those times to remember. You're trying to remember what are the most important things? What were those lessons that my father taught me? What were, what were those things that, that they really instilled in me? And time and time again, I will hear the sons and daughters of these faithful men get up and say, well, you know what I can say? I can say that every time the doors of the church were open, we were there. That, that's not one time. That's many different times I've heard those same words come out of the mouths of children while they're at the funeral of their, their parents. Why? I can't, but I can say this. Every time the doors of the church were open, we were there. What did that do? Well, basically what they are saying is, the actions of my father preached a louder sermon to me than anything I ever heard while I was sitting in the pew. Because it showed a priority. It showed the, the, the place that God held in the heart of that father, in the heart of that parent. That they would give priority to God's house and to God more than anything else. I'll never forget myself as I grew into my teenage years. And uh, I, uh, as you can see from my... Um, extreme stature uh, didn't make it on the basketball team um, and literally was told by the head coach of, uh, of my school that I was too short to play on his team, that it wouldn't matter how, how good I could, I could be, um, that I was too short. And that ultimately, uh, grievingly, mournfully, sorrowfully led me to the wrestling mat. Uh, which ended up being the best thing that ever happened to me in high school. Um, but I'll remember uh, it was the summer between my um, sophomore and junior year. I had just come off of a, a very stellar um, wrestling season, um, wrestling at state for my, uh, in my second year. Everything was looking up for me in that area. And so, like many others, I started wrestling off-season. And all through the summer, I wrestled uh, what's called freestyle, Olympic style. And there was a wrestling camp that many of my friends and I were going to go and be a part of uh, that summer. And all week, every day, my dad took time off and drove me and some of my teammates down a couple of hours to this other city where this wrestling camp was being hosted. 
but my dad was a pastor. And on Sunday morning, he was not going to be able uh, to drive me or my friends down to this wrestling camp. And it was a battle for me even to be able to go on a Sunday. It was the only time I remember growing up that I was even going to be allowed to do anything like this. If there was a game scheduled for me on a Sunday, Mike didn't play. That was just it. It was, it was the Lord's Day, it was Sunday, and I just wasn't going to do it. And I, I fought and I begged, and I had paid a lot of money. <laughs> uh, and, and it was more of an acquiescence than it was permission. But basically the deal was, somebody else was going to have to take me. And I'll never, ever forget, there was no room for me that day. My dad had driven all these kids all week, and nobody could make room for me on that day to get to wrestling camp. And I ended up at church. It's interesting because normally on a Sunday, I had many different responsibilities. I was very involved in teaching in kids' church. I had all kinds of things. And Sunday mornings, normally, I would have an extreme amount of responsibilities. But because I was supposed to be gone, all my responsibilities had been taken away. I showed up at church in those days in jeans and tennis shoes and a t-shirt and felt like a uh, totally out of place because I wasn't in my you know, church clothes. I remember sitting there that day and it was like everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong in my teenage eyes because I wasn't supposed to be here. I'm, I'm not you know, dressed for church. I, I'm I was so out of place, not knowing what to do with myself because I usually had so much to do. And then they started service, and I love this woman with all of my heart to this day and did then. But I knew whenever she led worship, it was all going to be hymns. And it was all going to be organ music and hymns, and I just couldn't stand it at that time. And I sat there in that front row and I fought God. I fought God that morning. I don't want to be here. I wasn't supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be there. How could my friends uh, betray me like this? How how could my dad make me do this? How, you know, what? And now, and now we got, I got to listen to these stupid hymns and I don't even like these things. And I remember just fight. It was like I was... It was like I was wrestling God like Jacob in Genesis. And something broke in me. And it wasn't because of the hymns. It was in spite of the hymns. It was the Lord. And He touched me that day. I remember tears just streaming from my eyes almost uncontrollably weeping, not understanding, because I really, really thought that the Spirit only moved when there was an electric guitar. (laughs) And probably, I promise you, probably the sweetest touch that I've ever received from the Lord in in a manifest way. You know what I'm talking about. Those times where you just know that the Spirit of God has moved upon you in a way that moves you. It's not something that happens all the time. It's not something that we should expect to happen all the time. But the sweetest time that it ever happened was with the music that I hated on a day that I didn't think I was supposed to be there. I began to learn that day what it means to give priority to the Lord and to the house of the Lord on the day of the Lord. That if I had been where I was supposed to have been, which is such a lie, I was supposed to be right where I was, that I would have missed out on the very thing that the Lord wanted to teach me, the very thing that would go further for me in my life than that wrestling camp ever could have done. Of course, what I thought 
where the plans for my life at that time ended up not being the plans that God had laid out for my life. My labor on that day at the wrestling camp would have been in vain. And all is vain and vanity unless, I love that word, unless, in the King James, except, there is exception here. There is one exception to this vanity, and it is unless the Lord builds the house, unless the Lord watches over the city, unless the Lord is the one who gives rest. I want to also draw your attention to the eating the bread of anxious toil. Not only is there no satisfaction, there is no thanksgiving. Remember that the word, the, the proper word that is used for the Lord's Supper is the word Eucharist. It comes from the Greek Eucharisto, which means thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. There, there is a sense that when we come to the table of the Lord, though it is a solemn moment, it is also a joyful moment. There is a solemn rejoicing that ought to take place in our heart as we come with thanksgiving to the Lord's table and we will never eat from the Lord's table the bread of anxious toil. But what are we eating? We are eating the bread of rest. The bread of rest which reminds us that Christ stretched out His hands and said, It is finished. So there is a call to thanksgiving, whereas here there is no thanksgiving. Now don't get me wrong. When it says here, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. This is not an excuse to pull up a lawn chair, crack open a beer, and just say, well, God's going to take care of it all. I don't have to do anything. That's not what the call is in this passage. It is not a call to laziness, lest we forget that both the Old Testament and the New Testament condemns sloth or laziness as a sin, condemns the sluggard throughout the Bible. But what is this about? This is about who is king of your heart? Who is king of your heart? As you ply your trade, as you apply yourself to your work, as you mothers apply yourself to rearing children, fathers to rearing children, husbands and wives to working for your wages, to provide for your family, who is king of your heart? Who, to whom belongs the glory at the end of that work day? Is it to you for your craftiness and cleverness and, and, and creativeness and getting the job done? Or does it belong to the Lord who gave you breath, who, who knit your sinew and muscles together so that you would have the strength to do the work that you are doing, who gave you the brain that you needed to operate and function, let alone come up with the creative, clever ideas that helped you get the work done that you needed to get done. Who is king in your heart? Another way to say this is, around whom does your life revolve? A long time ago, I, I really had a, a shift in my understanding because I was very much raised with a priority one, priority two, priority three kind of understanding of life. And, you know, God has to take precedence. The problem with that is that it's easy to say, well, God, God is God is God is God, God, God. You always have to get a little more pious sounding when you say, right, God. God is, is my number one. Right? It's easy to say. But the proof is in whom does your life revolve around? It's more like those crafts that we used to do as a kid where they gave us those little brass uh, uh, 
brads that you stick through and you fold open so that something can spin around something. Rather, God, Christ Himself, should be at the center of your life so that the rest of your life revolves around Him, revolves around His Word, revolves around His authority, revolves around His will for your life. Because it's easy to say, oh, He's number one. And yet your life revolves around you. Do you see how foundational something like unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor in vain becomes as you begin to understand that unless my whole life revolves around God, the foundations that I am laying are going to crumble. I recently was um, reading about uh, some houses in the eastern part of our United States. Beautiful, beautiful homes sometimes multi-million dollar estates today that were built in a particular time period where all of the, the sand and grit that was needed for the cement of the foundations were being drawn from one particular quarry and unbeknownst to the people in that day, there was one particular ingredient or mineral that was present in that mix that at the end of of it all now is causing all of these foundations to just crumble away so that from the outside it looks like everything is beautiful gorgeous amazing and yet it might be condemned as unlivable because of the ingredients that were in that foundation you may think that you are doing the right things let's get back to the idea about the select teams for a minute and I'm not trying to pick on anyone here this morning Necessarily, I'm preaching to myself as well. But let's look at our culture. Let's look at ourselves. And what precedence have we given the Lord in the lives of our family? And what precedence have we given the house of the Lord in the lives of our family? When we will pay exorbitant prices for things that we deem necessary in our children's lives, can I pick on us for a minute? Do it, please. <laughs> Cosmetic oral dentistry. Extra lessons. Tutoring. Special select training by this coach or that coach thousand dollar camps thousand dollar training videos we will pay exorbitant prices for these things because we deem them as necessary for our kids and I'm not saying you shouldn't have done it you shouldn't do it I'm not saying that what I'm saying is if you will go to those kinds of links for those kinds of things in your children's life, but on Sunday morning you can't drag yourself out of bed and get them and you to church on Sunday morning, that will preach a louder sermon to them than I ever could over the course of their lives. You will drive to kingdom come to get them to that sporting event or get them to that appointment or that thing that they want to do but you haven't made sure that they're in church on Sunday morning you will you will sit down with them and you will go through finance and teach them how to fill out a checkbook and do all of these things hear me good things right things you ought to do those things I'm not saying you ought not to do those things but if you will do that, but you won't sit down and read the Bible with them, or you won't sit down and walk with them through some of the most foundational things regarding our faith, even as simple as teaching them the truths of the Apostles' Creed, or to teach them the Lord's Prayer, to teach them how to pray, to pray in front of them, to, to tell them to give guidance, to give structure, to give stability in their lives, to say these things are our priority in our lives because of X, Y, and Z of what this book says, and because of that, A, B, and C, we will not be doing as a family. 
If you will not do that, your silence in those areas will preach a louder sermon to them over the course of their lives than they will ever hear from me. And you are eating the bread of anxious toil, teaching them all those other things, if you have not taught them about the most important thing in their life. How many of you would let your kid walk out the door without brushing their teeth? You've taught them the importance of cleaning their teeth, I hope. They get to a certain age, now they have to take a shower. They get to another certain age, now they've got to wear some deodorant. Right? You start asking them these questions. Some, some parents, you don't walk out the door unless you've got a jacket, an umbrella. I mean, we could go, some people go, I mean, it, they're going out in a rubber ball, but a plastic ball, okay? You, you understand what I'm saying. There are so many things that are important, that are good things, and we just go nuts trying to make sure that our kids get these things. You want to make sure they know their alphabet, they know how to read and write, they know how to count, they know how to do these things, and yet you have not taught them about the Lord. You've left that to somebody else, me or someone else. And you wonder why I ask, whom does your life revolve around? You or the Lord? This is about the fear of the Lord. This is why I said what this teaches us what it means to walk coram Deo before the face of God, circumspectly to understand that every day of my life, the Lord above, who is the watchman, is watching over me. And what am I spending my life for? Am I spending it with my labor in such a way that my labor will be built upon the foundation that lasts? Or am I laboring to build upon a foundation that ultimately will crumble? Because I remembered some important things but forgot the most important thing. This is about who gets the glory for what has been done. I want you to see God's judgment in two directions this morning. The first we'll briefly look at is in Daniel chapter 4, verse 26 through 28. Believe it or not, Daniel chapter 4 is not written by Daniel, but actually by a pagan king. You've heard his name before, Nebuchadnezzar. And here in Daniel chapter 4, I'll briefly just read verses 26 through 28. King Nebuchadnezzar is recalling a happening in his own life. And it says here, it says, uh, excuse me, I believe I have written the wrong. Sorry, beginning in verse 28, not verse 26. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? Now before we move on, what's our text this morning say? Unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain. Now just so you know, at the moment that King Nebuchadnezzar utters these words, he is the richest, he is the most powerful, he is the uh, biggest king in all of the earth at that time. He rules over the entire known world at that time. There is no one greater than Nebuchadnezzar living on the earth at that time. 31, listen to this, I love this. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. 
And you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time, seven years, shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Nebuchadnezzar had everything. This is another one of those reasons why we should never look at affluence alone as the mark of God's blessing in someone's life. We should also likewise not look at the lack of things as God's curse. We're going to look at this from two different directions, but sing King Nebuchadnezzar. He had everything, literally everything. Everything, anything that he could have wanted or desired was at his fingertips. He had it all. And he believed that he had built it all, that it all belonged to him. And so he says, look what I have done by my own might. And God did what? Humbled him literally to the ground. You, you read the rest of it and what God has to say and what his life looked like and you begin to find that the creators of beauty and the beast were not that creative. Literally, the beast that Nebuchadnezzar becomes is much like what the description of the beast and beauty and the beast is like. And for seven years, he lived that way, literally out of his mind, lost his kingdom. Beautifully, at the end of that time he lifts up his eyes to heaven and he recognizes God as the Most High and God restores him to the kingdom. Amazing. Now turn, if you would, to Haggai chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1. And we'll look at this from another direction. That was from the, the position of having everything. Now we will look at it from a position of having nothing. And my mind has gone blank and I can't remember where Haggai is. In between Zephaniah and Zechariah. Okay, praise God. <clears throat> These small minor prophets, you can flip over them without even realizing it and then you start to second guess yourself and there we go Haggai chapter 1 we'll read verses 2 through 15 quickly this morning thus says the Lord of hosts these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. Remember eating the bread of anxious toil. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And you brought it home and I blew it away. Why? Declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beasts, and on all their labors. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatil, and Joshua, the son of Jehazadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, in the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. 
and they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. So now we see a different picture. We're coming at it from a different direction. Here are the people of Israel. And what do they have? They have nothing. No matter how hard they're working, no matter how hard they are laboring, their houses are still in ruin, their fields are laying fallow. No matter how much money they seem to bring in, it never seems to be enough. Sounds like inflation to me. And the Lord comes and he speaks to them and he says, and you expected something else? Why? Because you are focused on laboring over your own homes while my home lays in ruins. Now, I have seen this passage used to launch building campaigns for churches. That is not what we're doing this morning. I will reiterate what I said this morning. Thank you for your faithfulness as those of you who have have continued giving during this time. That's not what this is about. What this is about is how in our own hearts we can be so preoccupied with our own homes, with our own lives, with our own goings on that we neglect the Lord and His house in our hearts. See, you can show up here every week and still neglect the Lord's house in your heart. You can give more than anybody else financially to the church and still neglect the Lord's house in your heart. This is about who is king of your heart. This is about who gets the glory for what has been done. I have, I have, I have uh, had the great displeasure of depositing exorbitant checks in church bank accounts only to have those who have given them come back expecting the glory for what had been given to the house of the Lord instead of the Lord. It takes that offering and sullies it. This has to do with the fear of the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar had everything, but he would not recognize God. The fear of the Lord was not in him, and so God took it. The people of Israel had nothing because they did not have the fear of the Lord, and God kept it. And they, above all people, were called to live in the fear of the Lord. This reminds me of Jesus teaching in Luke chapter 12. I almost wonder if Jesus had Nebuchadnezzar in mind. <laughs> I almost wonder if he had Nebuchadnezzar in mind because of the way that he refers to this and how the king of the universe might look upon the king of an earthly kingdom's greatness, so to speak. Luke chapter 12 verse 13 Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? What a question when uh, the judge of the whole earth says that. Um, and he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich, listen to what it says, towards God. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You can provide everything for your family. 
in the way of worldly goods and possessions. But if you lead them not in the ways of righteousness, if you lead them not in the fear and admonition of the Lord, then you have done them the greatest disservice that you could ever do for them. Your theology can be 100% on point and yet not live according to the fear and admonition of the Lord. You could pass with flying colors a systematic theology test, but your life doesn't actually revolve around God. That will speak louder to your children who are, as this text will tell us in a moment, your heritage from the Lord than all of your ability to speak right theological things. Carrying on, Jesus says to His disciples, Therefore, so now He's, he's told these people, be on guard against covetousness. Man's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. He, he tells this, this story, and, and again, I, I think it's interesting to wonder if maybe he was thinking of Nebuchadnezzar, maybe not, but I just think it's fun to think of the king of all the universe thinking about the king uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest man on earth at the time, as just a, a farmer with barns. But anyways, and he said to his disciples, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small of a thing as that. I love that, right? Yeah. Who can add an hour to your life? If you're not able to do as small a thing as that, adding an hour to your life. Thanks, Jesus. Um, if then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Then he says, consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, hey, listen here, even Solomon, our author of Psalm 27, in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today, and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek His kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Who is king of your heart? It's amazing that when you begin to understand that the Lord is your provider and provision Himself, how much more generous you can be no matter how much you have. But when you don't see God as your provider, but see yourself as your provider, which often means you are laboring in vain, then you will say, tomorrow and tomorrow, when I have this much in the bank account, then I can start being generous. When, I, when, when we get to this place in, 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 in what our plans are for our life, then, you know, we can do this thing or that thing. Or to get a little more personal and speak to some of the young people in the congregation this morning as we move into speaking about children. Well, when this much time has passed, or we've got this much in the bank account, or we've been able to get to know each other this much, then we'll have children. Let me tell you something. God knew that you needed to get to know one another before you had children. That's why He made it last about 10 months to make one. And if you're not ready to have kids, you're not ready to get married. That's just, that's just it. That's just it. And that's what I'll tell you in marriage counseling. Come and see me. (laughs) 
Unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain. This applies to our church. We can, we can labor. We can, and, and that, that, is the, that is the physical labor. That's the setting up, the tearing down, driving trailers, putting music sheets together, doing all the things. And, and we could go beyond. We could, we could scrimp and pull all our money together. We could, we could paint all the, the, the big giant, what are they called? The big giant signs, the billboards. We could, we could make billboards. We could mail things to everyone in San Antonio. We could sit on the street corners and ring bells and try and get people to come in. We could, we could do all those kinds of things. We could try to come up with every creative idea that we could to get people into this place and grow out of it and get into another place and grow out of it and get into another place and grow out. We could try to do all of those things, but unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain. Even if we were to fill those places, if it was not for the fear and the glory of the Lord, it would mean nothing. And yet in the fear and the glory of the Lord, we can be content with little or with much, knowing that whether it is little or whether it is much, it is the Lord who has built it and who has given it or taken it away. It applies to our families. Unless the Lord builds the house, then we will be like the Israelites in Haggai, trying to panel the walls while in our hearts the house of the Lord remains in ruins, not giving priority. And our building will be in vain. Parents, what greater hope? I mean, guys, come on. The Mormons, the Mormons are not supposed to have the corner on the market for those who have a hope to see their family members in the hereafter. That's supposed to be ours. And is that not our hope? That our children will be with us in eternity? How can that be? if we will not be the ones building upon the foundation that matters. Jesus in Luke 6, 47 through 49, famously taught about the wise man and the foolish man. The wise man did what? He built his house upon the rock. Not only that, it says that he dug the foundation deep and built his, found, his house upon the rock. Don't be satisfied. Don't be satisfied with some kind of half-shot foundation for your family. Let us not be satisfied with some kind of half-shot foundation for us as a family, as the body of Christ. May our foundations be built upon the rock. Who is the rock? It is a who, not a what. Jesus is the rock that the builders rejected who has now become the chief cornerstone are you getting the message this morning from Psalm 127 that you can labor you can worry you can be anxious but it will all be in vain unless the Lord builds the house unless he does it and this should be your waking prayer this should be your restful prayer God, build our house. Let our labor not be in vain. We trust you. We, can we pray this together as a church? We trust you, God, with our church. Can it be our prayer for our families? God, we trust you with our family. When is the last time, dads, moms, you gathered your kids together and you held hands and you prayed together and you said, God, we trust you with our family. Did you know you can pray that when times are good and when times are bad? When times are good, God, we trust you. 
You're not going to allow us to fall prey to what Jesus was talking about in Luke 12, being covetous about things. God, we trust you to teach us how to be generous, to teach us how to live with open hands, teach us how to be hospitable, teach us to own our possessions and not be owned by them. God, we trust you to build us as a family. And then trust him. Go to bed. Go to sleep. Turn the phone off. Chuck it in a drawer. Shut the computer. Shut it down. Spend time with your family. Rest. Because God is in control and not you. Now when it's work time, open it back up and get it back out and apply yourself to your work faithfully. Faithfully, righteously, honestly, with integrity, work hard while it's time to work. And when it's time for work to be done, work on the other things that matter. Your family, your children, your church, your fellowship with believers. Your life should not be spinning so fast and so much that you have no room for those things. I guess I'm going to preach this morning. Praise God. Three through five will move quickly. What's the first word? Behold. And that's what it should do to you as you read the text. Wait, whoa, check. Do you see that? Look at that. Behold, that's what it means. Look, look here, look at that. Check this out. And what does it say? Children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, a reward. Hello, people. Children are a heritage from the Lord, a reward. The fruit of the womb is a reward but our culture treats it like a curse. Even within the church, sometimes people treat it like a curse. Oh, you had another one? Do you know how that happens? Do I need to make you a diagram? No, I got it. It's working. But how are you going to pay for it? You know, kids are expensive. No, they're a reward. They're a heritage. A heritage. What does that mean, heritage? It's more than a gift. It's something that will go on when you don't. And those children are the building blocks of the things Solomon was just talking about. For there is no house apart from the children. There is no city apart from the children. Even the pagan can understand that without children there is no future. You stop having kids, your civilization dies. You stop having kids, your culture dies. Some people have it figured out. The UK will be taken over by Islam, not by force, but by outbreeding. The average English home has about 1.6 children, whereas the average Muslim home has 6.1, I think. It's just a matter of time. What heritage will remain the one that came from the womb. Children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Well, what about those who can't have kids? Do they miss out on that reward? Do they get no heritage? No, that's not what this is saying. They are a part of the house. 
especially when they are a part of the house of the Lord. Because now, every child that is within the house of the Lord becomes a child that they righteously can leave their mark upon for good. As they spend themselves in the investment of those children, a heritage is left for them. And they, those kids, the fruit of someone else's womb, becomes a reward for them as well. It says, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, the King James says, in the hand of a strong man are the children of one's youth. There's, there's, there's motion in this because the arrow is not meant to just be a symbol in the hand, but rather there is a sense in which that arrow will remain in the hand only long enough to be strung upon that arrow and let loose to go forward, to expand, to go into the future. They are shot out with purpose. And it says, Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. The gate was the place of judgment in ancient civilization. It's where they would have their court cases with the elders of that city. And remember that a thing shall be established in the mouths of two or three in that culture. And so for a person to have, and in this case, uh, the word children here in verse 3 literally means sons. There are places in Scripture where it is ambiguous and it can mean sons and daughters. Literally here, children means sons. And it was only sons that could stand in the gate as witnesses in a court case because females' witness didn't count which is part of the scandal of the New Testament witness of the Gospels because it was the women who came and said, Jesus has risen, right? That was part of the scandal. But here in that civilization that Solomon is writing into, he's, he's saying, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them, who's full of sons because he shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. That means when someone has something evil to say about him, though his character is godly, his sons will be there to stand up as witnesses to his character. And if there were only one, the thing would not be established. But in the mouths of two or three, a thing is established. And in the confines of that city, of that community, those children, that father, would be known by his sons. So much literally that in that culture, the father's name would change after his son was born. So that he became known as the father of those that son, the father of that son. And so in that community, if those three, two or three sons stood up and gave an unfaithful witness about their father, it would be known for the lie that it is. But a godly man whose, whose house is being built by the Lord while he labors a godly man who is watching over his own home and community even as the Lord watches over him. The godly man who is laying down at night and sleeping and resting because he's not eating the bread of anxious toil can stand with confidence in the gates before his enemies as his sons stand and bear witness to his godly character. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. Blessed is the church who bears them. Blessed is the community that has them as they are raised and their lives are built upon the foundation that matters. Children are a heritage from the Lord, a reward, arrows, blessing, security, protection. They are defense from shame. They're a gift and not a curse. They're a gift and not a curse. Now that does not mean that more children means more of God's favor and less children mean less of God's favor. That's not what it means. Remember, as we said with Nebuchadnezzar, and with the children of Israel. Let us not 
look at affluence as the mark of God's favor or the lack as God's curse. Rather, each one has been given their lot in life, and the fruit of the womb is a reward. It is a reward for them. But it is not to say that everybody should have the same amount of kids. That is a decision that needs to be brought before God and before the authority of His Word and worked out fearfully between a husband and a wife before the Lord. But quickly, I want to point your direction to just one psalm further. Psalm 128. And imagine what it would be like to be journeying up the mount of the Lord to the temple, having just sung Psalm 127, having just sung to each other about the vanity of building, the vanity of watching, the vanity of trying to rest unless the Lord builds, watches, and gives it. And then to open your mouth and sing Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. It's like that funny uh, despondent echo, right? Hello, hello, hello. And what you hear back is, how are you, how are you, how are you? It would kind of throw you off, right? There's somebody else here. And there's a sense in which Psalm 128 responds to the vanity of Psalm 127, reminding us that while all is vanity unless the Lord does it, Psalm 128 reminds us that there is blessing for those who fear the Lord. Maybe today some of what has been said has made you mad. the truth will tick you off before it sets you free. Maybe it's hurt your feelings. Sometimes the truth does that because the truth isn't concerned about your feelings. But there is someone who's concerned both with your freedom and with your feelings, and it is the Lord. Not because the Lord doesn't want to hurt your feelings. He's got no problem with that. But because He wants your emotions and your feelings to be brought into subjection to the authority of His Word because He wants blessing for you. What would it be like if you had a father who confessed orthodox religion but was a complete jerk all the time. It probably would put a bad taste in your mouth for orthodox religion. But that's not the kind of father that we have. Listen to this out of Zephaniah three, seventeen: The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by His love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Imagine then what it is to have a father who exalts over you with singing. There is labor you have been called to. There is watching that you have been called to. There is preparation and work that you have been called to. Imitate your father as you get busy with it. Your father who will exalt over you with singing. 
The Lord labors and builds the house, but for him it is not a chore. The Lord is wakeful and watches over the city, but for him it is not a thing of anxiety. And the Lord gives rest to his beloved because he is a God of rest. And it is to that rest that he has invited you. Lest we forget Mary and Martha. Luke chapter 10, 38 through 42. I won't read it, but remember. The two sisters of Lazarus. And Jesus came to visit them one day. And Martha busied herself about the house. Cleaning and cooking and preparing. While Mary sat at Jesus' feet. Martha was ticked off. Went and tattled to the Lord. Lord, have you seen what Mary has done? She hasn't helped me do anything around here. Do you know what Jesus said? Mary hath chosen the good part and what she has will not be taken away. It wasn't that stuff didn't need to get done in the house. It was that the most important thing that needed to be done was to sit at Jesus' feet. Matthew 6.33 echoes what we read in Luke 12. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. May this be a strong encouragement and exhortation to us all today, myself included. Amen? Would you stand with me this morning? Father, we thank you for your word, God, this morning. We thank you for this song of ascents, this song of Solomon. Lord, that reminds us of the vanity that it is to try and build without you. To try to protect without you. Lord, it is so easy for us to eat the bread of anxious toil considering all the things that we have to do. And we forget to remember what you have done. Lord, may we be reminded what you have done. How you sent your Son to save us. How you called us by your Spirit. Regenerated our hearts. That you you have given us a... Uh, Lord, a, a new heart that seeks after your will. And so, God, I pray that even as, uh, Lord, the, these sons in Haggai, their hearts were stirred up to obedience. God, I pray that today our hearts will be stirred up to obedience. That, God, we would refuse to pick up a hammer, to put our hands to any plow unless we know that the work that we are doing is to work alongside and with you. Lord, show us how we can get busy in the work that you are doing. And God, I pray that you would be mighty to save. Lord, in ways that we have neglected to build upon the proper foundation, in ways that we have neglected, we have labored in vain with so many possibly even important things, but we have neglected the most important thing. God, I pray that you would restore what the worm has eaten. I pray that you would bring quick, great fruitfulness where there has been barrenness in our lives. And God, I pray that we would see the fruitfulness of that labor and that watching in our children, in our children as the body of Christ, all of our children, 
that we would see them grow up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. That the heritage that they will be will be a heritage that is built upon the foundation that you have already laid, built upon Christ, the solid rock. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This morning we are going to sing uh, Psalm 127. Thank you again, Landon. Um, to the tune of, O God, our help in ages past. Okay, something like that. All right. Except the Lord do build the house, the builders lose their pain. Except the Lord the city keep, the watchmen watch in vain. Tis vain for you to rise betimes, or late from rest to keep. To feed on sorrow's bread, so gives he his beloved sleep. Lo, children are God's heritage, the womb's fruit his reward. The sons of youth as arrows are for strong men's hands prepared. O oh, happy is the man that hath his quiver filled with those. They unashamed in the gate shall speak unto their foes. Amen. God bless you as we move into a time of Eucharist, of thanksgiving at the Lord's table. Amen.